I'd like to give particular thanks to Ms. Hupp, uh, a constituent from the state of Texas, whose testimony I think was moving and powerful, and, and your personal life experience I think is very important for this debate. Uh, and I would urge anyone interested in assessing what the proper standard is for protecting our right to keep and bear arms to watch Ms. Hupp's testimony, to see her personal experience of the importance of the right to keep and bear arms, to protect ourselves and to protect our family. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, uh, I'm speaking for myself today and not in any official capacity. Uh, I, I wanted to mention right off the bat that when you opened the proceedings here, you asked all of the victims of gun violence to stand, and I hesitated. But honestly, I don't view myself as a victim of gun violence. I view myself as a victim of a maniac who happened to use a gun as a tool. And I view myself as a victim of the legislators that we had at the time that uh, left me defenseless. So that's why I hesitated. Um, I didn't grow up in a house with guns. I'm, I'm not a hunter. But when I was 21 and I moved out on my own, I was given a gun by a friend and taught how to use it. And then uh, I had a patient when I was in the city of Houston who was the district attorney, an assistant district attorney in Houston. And he actually convinced me to carry the gun, which at that time was illegal in the state of Texas. He said, Susie, you don't see this stuff. I do. You need to carry your weapon and nobody's going to mess with you. Several years later, in 1991, my parents and I went to have lunch at a local cafeteria with a friend of mine that was managing the cafeteria that day. We'd finished eating when all of a sudden this guy drove a pickup truck through the floor to ceiling window. It came crashing in and ended up maybe 15 feet from me. Of course, we thought it was an accident. And I rose up and began to go help the people that he had knocked over. But then we heard gunshots. And my father and I immediately got down on the floor. We turned the table up in front of us. My mom got down behind us. And the shooting continued. Now, at that time in 91, you know, we weren't seeing these mass shootings that we're seeing now. So I was waiting for him to say something like, all right, everybody put your wallets up on the table. Or, or you know, I thought maybe it was a hit. Maybe there was somebody important in there. But the shooting continued. I'm going to tell you it took a good 45 seconds, which is an eternity, to realize that the guy was simply going to walk around, take aim, pull the trigger, go to the next person, take aim, pull the trigger. He was executing people. When I did realize it, I thought, I've got him. I've got this guy. I reached for my purse that was on the floor next to me. Realized I had a perfect place to prop my arm. He was up. Everybody else in the restaurant was down. And then I realized that a few months earlier, I had made the stupidest decision of my life. I had begun leaving my gun out in my car because I did what most normal people would do. I wanted to be a law-abiding citizen. I didn't want to get caught with a gun and maybe lose my license to practice. I remember looking around and thinking, well, great, what do I do now? Throw a salt shaker at him? At that point, my dad took my attention, and he started to raise up. He said, I've got to do something. I've got to do something. He's going to kill everybody in here. And I tried to hold him down by the shirt collar. But when he saw what he thought was a chance, he went at the guy. You have to understand, though, a man with a gun in a crowded room has complete control. My dad covered maybe half the distance, and the guy just turned and shot him in the chest. My dad went down in the aisle, maybe seven or eight feet from me, and he was still alive and still conscious, but as dreadful as this may sound, I saw the wound and I basically wrote him off at that point. The good news is that it made the gunman change directions slightly. Instead of coming directly toward me, he went off to my left. And at that point, somebody way at the back of the restaurant broke out another window. And I remember hearing that crash and thinking, my God, here comes another one. But instead, I saw people getting out that way. So I looked up over the top of the table. When the gunman had his back to me, I stood up. I grabbed my mother by the shirt collar. I said, come on, come on. We got to run. We got to get out of here. And my feet grew wings. I made it out that back window, ran into my manager friend that was coming out a side door. And he said, thank God you're all right. And I said, yeah, but dad's been hit and it's really bad. And I turned to say something to my mother and realized that she hadn't followed me out. 
Now, to wrap the story up, the police officers, several of them were patients of mine, told me a few days later they filled in the gaps. They said that they were actually one building away in a conference, and in an odd twist of gun control fate, the hotel where they were having their conference, the manager there didn't want them to be wearing their guns and potentially offending any of her clients or customers. So she had asked them to leave their guns in their cars. So precious minutes were lost while they retrieved their guns from their locked cars. They said that when they got over there and worked their way in through the broken window behind the pickup truck, they didn't know who the gunman was. There were bodies everywhere. But they said they did see a woman out in the aisle on her knees cradling a mortally wounded man. They said they watched as some 30-something-year-old man walked up to her. They said she looked up at him. He put a gun to her head. She looked down at her husband, and he pulled the trigger. That's how they knew who the gunman was. They said all they had to do was fire a shot into the ceiling, and the guy immediately rabbited to a back bathroom alcove area. He exchanged a little gunfire with them and then put a bullet in his own head. Twenty-three people were killed that day, including my parents. It didn't occur to me at the time, but Mom wasn't going anywhere without Dad. They had just had their 47th wedding anniversary. So you may think that I was angry at the guy that did it, but the truth is that's like being mad at a rabid dog. You don't be mad at a rabid dog. You take it behind the barn and you kill it, but you don't be mad at it. But I've got to tell you, I was mad as heck at my legislators because I honestly believe that they legislated me out of the right to protect myself and my family. And I would much rather be sitting in jail right now with a felony offense on my head and have my parents alive to know their grandchildren. With that, I thank you.